Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalom, you is a light. Welcome in the room on this holy Shabbat. Israelites coming in the room from all over the world. Indianapolis is in the house. California in the house. New Orleans in the house. All over the world. Shalom, shalom. I even see administrators in the room already. Hallelujah. 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 Shabbat shalom. Yes, Texas in the house, Illinois and Atlanta. North Carolina is in the house. Shalom, shalom. Once again, Texas, another Texas in the house. Florida in the house. Missouri in the house. Florida in the house. Pittsburgh. Pennsylvania in the house. Alabama in the house. Mississippi. Is in the house took on, on this holy Shabbat. Lost, lost wages is in the house. Shalom, South Carolina, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia. Shalom, shalom. Baltimore, Maryland, in the house. On the Holy Shabbat. And all I say is hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maryland. Shabbat Shalom, Zion. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Kalamazoo in the house. New York is in the house. Oh, yeah. What's Palm Beach? Rialto, California. Hallelujah, hallelujah. St. Louis, Missouri. Hallelujah. Houston, Texas. In the house. Oh, yes. From all over the world on this holy Shabbat, we welcome you, all of you, my father's children. As we come together once again on this holy Shabbat, to give our Abaya praise, honor, and glory. To lift up his name in all the earth. Why? Because his name, his power, his might, his ability, and his reputation is worthy. Worthy what, more? Oh, worthy to be praised. Worthy to be praised in the highest. Worthy to be praised on the mountaintops. Worthy to be praised in the valley 
lose. He's worthy to be praised. In the good times, yeah, yeah. He's worthy to be praised in the bad times. He's worthy to be praised in the times of wealth and in times of poverty, in times of a crowd, in times when you're all alone. He's worthy to be Praise. And I can hear some of y'all say, Margaret, you don't know what I'm going through. It don't matter what you're going through. He's still worthy to be praised. Somebody say, I got pain right now, racking in my bones. Well, in the midst of the pain, he's still worthy to be praised. Somebody said, Mama, you just don't know. My pillow is stained with tears. Well, he's still worthy. <laughs> what? Tear-stained eyes and mournful cries will soon be over. There'll be no more weeping, no more wailing. Zion, he's still worthy to be Praise. More my month is so much longer than my money. Okay. I understand it. But that does not take away from the fact that he, our Abaya, is still worthy to be praised. And that's what we're doing on this Holy Shabbat. Now, if you can see the more okay, hear me okay. Once again, I don't know what's been going on with this computer these last few times I've been live. The color keep jumping in and out. We're going to ignore it on this Holy Shabbat and, and keep it moving. <laughs> Why? Because it's important that we get the message out. Now, if you understand that, Zion, would you be so kind? At the place of number seven, I see them sevens already rolling in here. And all I can say to that is hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I got some words of, uh, of encouragement for the house of Israel. Hold on one second. I got some words of encouragement for the house of Israel. Most, Most High gave me these words to give to you. And we're going to do it. What's the first one? Number one. The last days. That's the days we're living in. The last days for us. Zion. Are not scary. Write that down. Write it down. This is our this is our word of admonition on this holy Shabbat. Let me encourage the house of Israel. The last days for us is not scary. It's scary for them. It's not scary for us. Don't be scared of nothing in these last days, Zion. Why? One, because our king said, when you see all this stuff happening, don't be troubled. Don't be scared. This ain't, this ain't about you. This, this is not, what's going on in the world, going on in the world now is really, is really a preparation for your redemption. So why are you nervous? Why are you shaking and why are you troubled when your redemption, according to Luke chapter 21, is drawing near? We are about to be purchased, finally. We're about to be redeemed, finally. We're about to be set free from captivity, 
Finally, we're about to have our own land. We're about to have our own home. We're about to have every man his own fig tree and every man his own vine. Finally. Finally, we can drink from our own water without somebody putting the price on water. Finally, we get a chance to live in our own houses. Finally, we get a chance to have our own homeland, our own king, our own judgment. Finally, we can go where we want to go without somebody pulling us over and spitting tobacco talking about, where y'all going, boys? You belong over here or not, boys? Finally, them days will be gone. No more high prices in the stores. No more high electricity bill that we can't pay. No more unjust courts. You better be, this ain't no time to be troubled. <laughs> no, Zion. This ain't no time to be troubled. I just want to put that out to the whole world. Listen, listen, Zion, please hear me. I don't care where you are. This ain't no time for anxiety. It's not no time for panic. Oh, more than, what is it time for? Repent. That's what it's time for. This is time for repentance. Now, I'm not gonna go too deep in this because I've done it already in other videos, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna share this with you. Word of admonition. This year's Day of Atonement should have changed your life because it sure did mine. After the Feast of Trumpet to the Day of Atonement, I personally went into that time asking Abba Yah to expose my sins. I, 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 I told the whole world to do it. I did it with you. I said, y'all, let me do a self-examination like my cousin from the tribe of Benjamin. Let me look within myself. And when I looked within myself, me and my cousin had the same thing in common. Who, what cousin? Shaul. Y'all know him as Apostle Paul. My cousin looked inside of him. He said, man, when I looked inside of me, I looked at my flesh. I realized something. What'd you realize, Paul? He said, man, I looked in my flesh. I said, ooh, ain't no good thing in here. So I took that serious from the Day of Atonement, I mean, from the, from the Feast of Trumpet to the Day of Atonement. Looked inside myself and said, woo. I looked in there and I said, ooh, ain't nothing good in here. And I laid myself before the most high Yah. And he revealed my sins. And there were so many sins. I was, <laughs> y'all have no idea. I was confessing like a baby. With his hand caught in the cookie jar. <laughs> I was like, oh my, oh my. Because the Bible said, be sure your sins will find you out now. Then I went to confessing. To who, more Number one, to Yah. And number two, to the people I had offended. Asking for forgiveness and cleansing. Some of them said, okay, of course, more I'll forgive you. Other ones said, I'll never forgive you. <laughs> said, okay, whatever. It was a cleansing time. Why'd you mention that? Because that was supposed to not only be a one-time event, but it is, to, it is to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Why? Because the very next uh, feast day, after we go through the Day of Atonement, is what? Sukkot. And we're not supposed to enter into Sukkot with unconfessed sin. We're not supposed to enter into Sukkot with animosity and hatred. We're not supposed to enter into Sukkot outside of the mindset of Torah. No, ma'am, no, sir. 
The whole idea of the Sukkot is to remind us of what? To remind us of our covenant relationship, number one with Yah and number two with each other. It's when we present ourselves. Having heard the trumpet, having gone through atonement, the last thing is the gathering. So what do we do in these last days? We are to take these feast days serious because they speak to us of the end. So what do we do? We not only re, uh, confess our sins, but turn from them. So whatever sin you connected in and involved with, turn from it. But more this sin got me bad. You can, un you, you can unhook it. You can take it out. I know they hooks all over you, all in your back. All they got you. I'm, just take them out. Every hook, every sin, and every weight that so easily besets us and hinders us from running this race, so that we can run it with patience. Just get rid of them. And then what? In these last days. Once you confess your sins and turn from them, study your Bible. We're going to do that today. Study your Bible. Don't be spending all your time on social media. The, the, the powers that be is trying to turn you into a cyborg. I'll get into that in another video. What's a cyborg? A person that is dependent on technology. Science. Well, you can't live without your phone. You can't exist without an iPad or a computer. Have you become one? Has, is it now an integral part of who you are? If so, put it down. Why? Because we got to study the Bible. So number one, what we should be doing Repent from all your sins, turn from them. Number two, study your Bible. You study it. And, and I, I'm approved today. Don't be dependent on none of these European commentaries. Please hear them all right. They don't have a clue. Because they're interpreting our scripture through white supremacy. You'll never see the truth. Your eyes will never open unless you reject all of that. It's perverted. It's polluted. Study for yourself and ask Abayah to show you things. What else? Do. Huh? Do. More what? Do what it says. Whatever you read while studying scripture, do it. And everything that he tells you not to do, watch this, don't do it. I was just talking, as a matter of fact, I hit up Yaron in the chat right before we came on live. His so-called Israelite put out a video years ago talking about the tide deception. And while he put that video out, that thing went worldwide, he was telling the awakening remnant of Israel, the house of Israel, not to pay Yah's tithe to the awakening. And now, then a couple of years later, he quit talking about, he out of this thing. Yeah, you should go. And don't ever come back. You putting the house of Israel under a curse. Don't you understand the scripture said, bring the time. They said, we want to return to you. You got to read that in Malachi. He said, return to me. 
and I'll return to you. And they asked a simple question. This ain't even deep. They asked the question, wherein, which is how, how can we, and in which way can we return to you? And he said, will a man rob ya? So right off the bat, we see how to get back. He said, will you rob me? And they said, how are we going to rob you? He said, in tithes and offerings. That's why you cursed. Now, all you stingy Israelites in the world that's trying to make that thing some kind of Christian whatever so that you exempt, you better hear the mori on this holy Shabbat. I didn't write that book, and I would never try to use the scripture in order to try to do something to, to, to promote myself or to mo promote the ark or anything I'm involved with. I'm trying to help Israel. Malachi wrote that. Not some Christian pastor trying to get another pair of alligator shoes or some kind of private jet. Everything he said. So if he said, bring the tent, bring it. Why? Get that curse up off of you. If he said, bring an offering, just bring it. Why? Get that curse off of you. Got to get the windows of heaven open. Listen, we not in the time where we need the windows of heaven closed. This is not a time where we need to be living under a curse. This is not the time when we need to have distance between us and our Abba. This is the time we need to be together. And he said, you're going to be cursed, period. He said, but if you do bring the tenth, now I'm just showing you what we about obedience. He said, but if you do bring that, what happens? I'll open the window, pour out a blessing. It'll be so much you won't have enough in your store. And on top of that, I'll make sure that you leave, that your trees don't cast the fruit before the time. I'm going to make sure that the man he goes on and on. He said, and you're going to be blessed. But nobody wants to preach that because it's unpopular. Why? Because it makes the quote unquote preacher look like he's begging for money. And I done told y'all a million times, I ain't in this for money. I'm in this for truth. And I'm not in it exempt from the tie. And don't look at the Mormon talking about, well, I mean, you the Mormon, you, I'm letting y'all have no idea. I, I, I've had a lot of money. I told you that before, but I've also been flat broke. I told you that before. But the one consistent thing is whether with money or no money, I can count the little bit I have and take 10% out and support the work of ministry. Support the work of the kingdom, and especially now that I know who Israel is, I'm going to support those who are supporting the house of Israel. I'm going to support those who are trying to, to, to teach, trying to sing, trying, trying to put out videos, animations, or whatever, trying to help the house of Israel wake up to a true identity. Why? Because as a more, I know that the world ain't going to support them. Who's going to support them? You think the Christian church is supporting the Israelites? You think this wicked government going to support the Israelites? You think just family members, cousins, and uncles, and aunties that's still shoving swine flesh down their throat, still keeping Sunday after the Shabbat, still talking about the Old Testament been done away with, is going to support the house of Israel? No. I'm not deceived. I know, I know we're all we got. So no, this this this, this so-called uh defector should have defected. It might be to the saving of his own soul. Twisting the word of Yah like that and causing so many of our people who are already bent towards selfishness to feel comfortable in their sin. I will never do that. 
I'm never going to make let you feel or, or teach you to be comfortable in wickedness. And whether or not you obey the scripture or not is really not my major concern. My job as a moray and a teacher and a seer in the house of Israel is to just show you the Bible. And once you see it, I've done my job. I've done my job. When I get to, into the kingdom, I told you I have to fall on my face at his feet. And the questions are asked to me because I know what's coming to me. He's going to say, watch me. I'm going to have to say, yes. Did you warn the wicked? That word is dysfunctional. Did you warn the wicked? Yes. Did you did you at least try to tell them every word that I said? I tried, yeah. Did you did you on purpose skip over certain verses that applied to you that you didn't want to preach? No, yeah. I preached it all. The things that I was strong in and the things that I was weak in, the things I was positive in and the things I failed in, I preached it all. And he gonna turn to me and maybe say something like this. Hmm. <laughs> Even though you did give your life to it, it was just your reasonable service. Now, who do you think you are? And I'm gonna tell him, I'm an unprofitable servant, but I'm still your servant. <laughs> I realized I was faithful of a few things. <laughs> I'm not going to be up there trying to boast and brag. No, no. I was unprofitable servant. But you see me at your feet. And I tried to tell the people whether they wanted to hear it or not. And I tried to do the best I could to, re to remove how I felt about everything and preach about what the truth is. And let the chips fall where they may. And Zion, that is my commitment to you that's my commitment to the Most High Yah first. And that's my commitment to you until I breathe my last breath. Why? Because Zion needs teachers who will teach it all. Need preachers who will preach it all and not try to twist it to gain followers, not try to twist it to become rich, not try to twist it to be popular, but just preach it the way it is and trust the most high. And that's what we do here at the Ark. I spend a lot of time on that on purpose. Because I want to tell everybody that's in the room, 460 people in the room, I need to talk to you about something. This is the time for obedience. This is a time that we, that we return to the covenant. I'm going to prove that today. I pray, Abba, y'all give me time to prove that this is about the covenant today. And of course, when we do that, then he promises to be a fence. <laughs> Ooh, don't worry, not yet. Don't, don't go to preaching yet. <laughs> he promises, he promises. He promised. And though I, Matthew 28, am with you.
How long? Always. Even to the end of the age. And if I be for you, I'm more than the whole world against you. And that's all we should be caring about right now, Zion, in these last days. That we have turned to the covenant and everything the covenant says for us to do, we do it. The things that he tells us not to do, we don't do those things. We bow at the feet of our king, Yahushua Hamashiach, submit our will to him, and then live the life of a living sacrifice, holy, which means set apart, and acceptable, which means following Torah, unto Yahuwah, which is our reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, and don't be conformed to this world. Don't let this world shape your mind, shape your heart, shape the way you think and, the, and your actions. No, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Again, Romans 12, how? By the renewing of your mind, which come right after uh, Roman 11, which hopefully we can get to that today. And then you'll prove what is that good and that perfect and that acceptable will of Yah. Study your Bible, read the scriptures, do what it says, do what he says. And then what else? Last admonition before the message. Stay prepared, Zion. Huh? Stay prepared. If you're not prepared now, get prepared. Once again, I need to speak to the house of Israel. Please hear the more we have some ignorant teachers in Israel that's coming over these airways, making fun of those of us who are preparing for the worst, making light of it, cracking jokes about it, trying to make us look stupid for prepping. Because that's all the word prepare mean, to be a prepper. They're trying to say, and these niggas out here caught himself being preppers. And I'm like, I know y'all, who laughs at a person who's prepared? That's the stupidest, most ignorant, asinine thing I ever heard in Israel. Laughing at a prepper is dumb as, what am I going to say? It's dumb as dumb could be. It's stupid as stupid can be. It, it, to not be prepared is to go against the covenant. It's to go against the covenant. Yes, people are a prepared people. Ain't nobody read the covenant about Joseph. So you're just going to ignore that. Seven years of preparation. You're going to ignore that. Tell you, you got to be careful of these so-called teachers in Israel. They're trying to lead you astray, Zion. Don't fall for it. We got three, at least three books from, from Solomon. Who's who tell you? Look at the ant. <laughs> Come on, Maury. Literally, look at the ant. It's a part of who we are. To be what? Prepared. For what? Anything. Water is essential. Three days, I'm telling you. Water is essential. Food is essential, but you can go longer. 
You can go almost 30 days. Most of us have enough body fat that can take us even past the 30, but I ain't going to say that for now. I'm just, I've never tried it myself, but I do know that scientifically speaking, the average human body, I'm talking about an adult, can easily go 20 to 30 days without starving to death. If they just have some water. And you can have some beans and rice, get enough protein and carbs to basically make it through any short-term catastrophe. You don't have to panic. And all you, if you got water, beans, and rice, all you got to do is use the water to boil the beans and steam the rice. <laughs> and then no panic. No, because in that case, your heart's going to be failing you for fear. But the more is here to tell you that there's no reason for you to fear in these last days, no matter what happens. Why? Because this is about the redemption of the true house of Israel, who is us. We did a whole revelation series to prove this end time is not scary for us. This is our hope. This is our joy. This is our great expectation. <laughs> This is our motivation. Now, I said a lot in the admonition. In actuality, I preached the admonition on this Holy Shabbat. Now, if everybody heard it crystal clear, put a 12 in here for the 12 tribes of Israel. Put a 12. For the 12 tribes of Israel. Why? We're not crystal clear. Who, who did it go to? The whole world. I checked the analytics of this channel. I don't really check them that much, but I checked the analytics of the channel a little while ago, and we are reaching almost every nation on earth. Every, every nation. Every kingdom on earth has at least one or two people watching the ark, watching this channel. So this message is going out to help Israel everywhere. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And told I would buy for all of you who support the work. Why? We need it now more than ever. We need it more than ever. I think so. What more? Oh, yes. With all the things going on in the world, with everything that's happening locally and it makes it even more crucial that you support this work because you're all we have to keep us full-time doing this. And I know having done this full-time almost, you know, my whole adult life, but for sure the last 12 years for the house of Israel, I can tell you, that we're moving into a time for ministries like this one, because it's not the only one, are gonna be vital for the house of Israel. And there's no way that we can be, that we are, that we can not focus. We, if, if we're gonna go into full-time ministry and go to battle, we can't go to battle and do something else. We can't read the Bible. It tells you, man, you got to plant the field, but you also should be partakers of what you work on. You don't muzzle the ox that's treading out the corn. Why? Because he's treading out the corn for you. How, how cruel is that to not feed the ox that's working to feed you? Paul said, you think he's talking about just oxen? 
No, he's talking about those of us who have been set apart to teach the word. And we've been ordained to have to live by it, which means we have to trust you. <laughs> but at the same time, you all are, are also believing and trusting us that we're going to continue to preach and teach the message in a clear way and an understandable way to the house of Israel with no smoke and mirrors, no tricks up our sleeves, no church trick. We ain't got none of that. So what do you have, Moray? The teaching and preaching of the word of Yah to the very best of our ability. Now, if you understood that, I tried to make it crystal clear. Would you be kind? Place a 100 in the chat, please. Put a 100 in the chat. We're going to continue. Yes, I know I went long on that. I had to. Because we are in these last days, Zion. And we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Support the work of the ark, especially if the ark is supporting you. You look forward to these times of us being together. You look forward to studying the Bible together and learning and understanding. Then we ask that you will support the work. Our work. has a constitution, it has a foundation. I've been doing this for a long time. I want you to hear it again. What is that? I want you to hear our 10 commandments because that is the base for all we are, all we do. It's the base of our covenant. That's why, that's why we play it. It's our constitution to the house of Israel, and it's our agreement. So let's listen to it. the Decalogue by the sounds of Sinai. <laughs> Yah commanded us to do all of these statutes, to fear Yah, our Elohim, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all of these commandments before Yah, our Elohim, as he has commanded us. Praise you, Father Yah. I will not have any other Elohim before you, nor bow down to any graven images too. I will take the name of Yah, my Elohim, in vain. I'll do. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. 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 And told our rabbi, which means thank you very much. Thank you. Multiply. Thank you. Expand it. For your prayers and your support of this work and for your commitment to the covenant. But even more than that, your commitment to your king, Yahushua Hamashiach, who is soon to return. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. Put that in the chat. Luke. Chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive this is captivity where into all nations no just one nation into all Nations. Who? These captives. Who are these captives? This is Israel. So you mean tell me Israel went into captivity into all nations? Yes. That's us. It's our ancestors. We are still most of us are still in the land of our captivity. Cannot be denied. Colon. In the King James Version, King Jimmy, put a colon. Why? Because what's following is a list, a small or partial list of the things that will happen once Israel is led into captivity into all nations. Now, already some of y'all eyes opened up on this verse. You just saw the verse like you've never seen it before. Why? Because we read it slow. We pointed out punctuation. And Jerusalem, the place, shall be trodden down. That means trodden means walked on, stepped on, stomped on. It's to put a place underfoot. It's disdain and disrespect. It's almost like a sign of triumph but in a negative way. Jerusalem, we trot it down. Of who? Well, if y'all gone, if we're gone into captivity, then the only people that can trot this down are those that ain't us. 
So who was that? The Gentiles. How long? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The name of today's sermon is the time of the Gentiles, the times, plural, of the Gentiles. For on today we shall reveal the truth. Unapologetically, we're going to reveal the truth of what the Bible reveals what the scriptures reveal to us about the times, the times of the Gentiles. It shall be revealed. If our by Yah allow us the strength and the breath to make it through this message, the world will see the truth once and for all. And if you all want to see the truth on this holy Shabbat, would you place a 1,000 in this chat, please? If you want to see the truth, hit the like button. 600 people in the room and only 271 likes. What is going on in Israel? Why is it so hard to come in the room and not hit light? You like it because you came in here. <laughs> Would you hit the like button? Let the world know what's going on, Zion. Help the, help the house of Israel wake up. Nobody is going to promote these videos but you. Once again, the times of the Gentiles explain. To us, it was given. Let me say it the other way. It was given to us to know the times the Hebrew Israelite. was given by Yah the times. For it's the Hebrew Israelite according to the Holy Bible that was blessed and advantaged with prophecy with the knowing of the times and the understanding of the times, that is a gift to Israel. The law and the prophets that spoke concerning time and the seasons of times was not given to any other people but Israel. Our Elohim said, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. 
I'm going to reveal things to you that have not happened all as though they have already happened. And the acid test of whether or not a prophet is the truth or not will be whether or not what he prophesied come true. If he talked to me, it's going to come true. If he talked to himself or if he had indigestion or if he ate some hot sauce before he went to sleep and came up with his own prophecy, you're going to know he's a false prophet and need a brick shower. Because he should have shut up. Didn't spend no time in my presence. Prophesying things he ought not. Claiming that he was, that he talked to me and I never talked to him. Talk to me, Jeremiah. Act like he heard from me and I ain't never seen this. Matter of fact, if he would have stood in my presence, I would have told him about keeping Torah. So he could help turn Israel from their sins. Time is, the, the, the times are given to us. Our king in Luke 24, I'm sorry, our king in Luke 21, verse 24, is once again showing us time. Which means that we ought to study time. We ought to study the times. We ought to know what time it is. So that we know where we are in time. Why? Because only the Holy Bible does this. There's not a man-made book on earth that can speak about the times and it be as true as true could be except our book. So everybody on earth, they always look into our book. And because I by Yah on purpose hid it from the Gentiles, he hid it from the wise and prudent, quote unquote. That, that's obviously the wise and prudent meaning of this world. He blinded them so that having eyes, they can't see nothing. Ears, they can't hear. They only talk. But I got news for them. And that is what? Their time. Who? The Gentiles. Y'all better hear me. The times of the Gentile is almost up. Now, if you understood that introduction to this message on this Holy Shabbat, would you be so kind as to put a 100,000 in the chat? The time and the signs of the time and the revelation of the end of times was not given to no other people but Israel. Anybody trying to interpret these last days, everybody is always going to go grab the Bible. No matter what religion they are, they're going to go grab our Torah. And then they're going to misinterpret. So let me put some correction on the misinterpretation of the times of the Gentiles.
Point number one. Oh, wait a minute, by the way, we're going to college. We're going to ARC University. This is, this is, this is, we're going to AU today. <laughs> we're going to ARC University. And I got to be professor. Dr. Yoshiahu Dawi Ben Israel. I'm your professor this afternoon. We got to sit in class. And I know some of y'all talking about, more. it was rough. I didn't hardly make it out of high school good. Don't worry about it. Different kind of university. This is a different kind of school today. Today, you have a professor named Dr. Yoshiahu that we've been in Israel that's going to take you to college and hold your hand. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to hold your hand while we study this college-level material. I'm not going to leave you out there all by yourself. I'm going to break down all the big words, and I'm going to help you see it. Because you can make an A. You can make an A after class today. Because my job is not to try to impress you with my knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. My job is to help you see what he already showed me. We got to go to college. And before y'all let your eyes glass over like, oh, we got to do some work. Yes, we got to do some work. Wake. Wake up. Wake up. Got to help the whole world today. This is too serious a business. So we go into class. Our first subject, as we study this time of the Gentiles, the first point today, this needs to go all over the world, and that is, I want to talk about first what this verse does not mean. That's the first thing I want to talk about. What, Maury? You heard me. The very first thing I want to talk about is what this verse don't mean, does not mean. I'm going to give you the European false interpretation of this verse. I'm going to show you how the European on purpose, twisting scripture to try to put themselves in our text. I'm going to show it to you. Oh, yeah, here we go. What it does not mean. This verse does not mean that Israel is done away with during the time of the Gentiles. It don't mean that. The time of the Gentiles. Every commentary that you read on this verse, they use this verse for replacement theology. I know this is college, but I gotta preach it, even though you may have to watch this video. You may have to watch this part 20 times before your eyes open, but I got to show you. This is where they decide to insert white supremacy and the so-called Christian doctrine of replacement theology. When they claim, and I'm going to use the word what they say, when they claim the Jews are the Yehudian, were kicked out 
And when they were kicked out, that was the time that now the European so-called Christian church has now replaced Israel. So with the replacement of Israel, that's during the time of the Gentiles, then now we now the hope is that one day Israel wakes up and joins the white Christian church. So you got all these so-called Christians praying for Israel that they'll wake up and join white supremacy. What my picture is that? They they trying to they out here preaching. They did what they believe that y'all removed the true Israelites and got us doing this now. Re remove all of our feet. They got us with bunny rabbits and eggs. We got to go to college. Remove the true house of Israel and give us Caesar Bourget images. Time of the Gentiles. You are lying and wonder. Well, they took away all of the burnt brass people. Put in here. I don't know what this is. You are lying. This ain't the time where this religion replaces Israel. These are all lies. Now, I'm going to prove it to you. I got more pictures, but because of time, I got to prove something to you. Let me prove it. Every commentary, every one, I only saw, really, I've only seen one person in my whole life, I've only seen one person that actually interprets this. I'm talking about non-Israelite, interpret this even halfway right. One. But out of the 30 or 40 different commentator, commentaries that's out there, and for sure the top 10 or 20 that I have studied extensively, every single one of them misrepresents this text on purpose. And they all follow the same logic. We're going to dispel that. I'm going to get one of the most popular ones to represent all of them. When? Right now on this Holy Shabbat. To prove to you that what I'm saying is the truth. They believe that this verse says that we've been rejected and the white Christian church is now the ones that are accepted and ruling during the time of the Gentiles. And these so-called heathen Gentiles turn around telling us that we got to join them to be saved. They're going to hell for that. Um, I was going to read a bunch of them. I said, you know what? I ain't got time to do that. I'm going to read one of them that everybody reads that sums it up for everybody. You can look this up in the pulpit commentary if you want to. I don't even know who wrote the commentary, when it came out, none of that. I'm just showing you, I'm picking one of them, one of the commentaries that come up out of Europe to show you what people are teaching concerning this verse and why even slumber brews all over the world are still believing this lie. Here we go. Here it is, by the way. You can screenshot it and read it for yourself. Matter of fact, I think I have another screenshot that's even more clear. If I don't have it right here, I, it'll come up. I got another screenshot that's even more clear. Because I said some of these Hebrews not going to even want to read it to the very end. But that's all right. We're in college, so we're going we're gonna to sit down and do it. Here we go. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I'm reading. This is for educational purposes. This is so that the Moray can prove that this heathen is lying. 
and got everybody thinking that this is the time of white supremacy. Let's read it. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, period. These few words carry on the prophecy past our own time. This is the, this is the European devil talking. Listen. How far past? Carry it on, carry it on close to the day of the end. The times of the Gentiles signify the whole period or epoch which must elapse between the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the beginning of the time and the beginning of the times of the end when the Lord will return. Watch. In other words, these times of the Gentiles denote the period during which they, the Gentiles, hold the church of Christ in place of the Jews. Do you see it? The notes appear when the Gentiles hold the place of hold the church of God in place of the Jews, in place of the Jews, in place of the Yehudian, in place of us. That's called replacement theology. This is the source of it. Disposal from that position of favor and honor. What? Disposal. What does that mean? That we've been disposed of. We were thrown away. We were done away with. No more favor, no more honor. We got kicked out. So it's over for us. He was done with us. So he put the, the white European Christian in his place. These words separate the prophecy of Jesus, which belongs solely to the ruin of the cry of the temple from, from the eschatological portion of the same prophecy. There, hitherto, this says, the word, uh, the Lord's words refer solely to the fall of Jerusalem and the ruin of it. What is you talking about? There it is right there. And if you keep reading these so-called commentaries, which I've told y'all they're from the devil, they will quote, got nerve to quote Romans 11, 24. We're in college. I told you we're in college today. Go to Romans 11, 24. Let's see what they're using for replacement theology. Y'all ready? They're going to combine these two. Let's go to Romans. I can already tell Israel like, wait, wait, what's going on here? Just hang on. Go to Hebrews 11, 24. This is what they use to back it up. They say Hebrews 11. Let me see. Let me make sure. Wait, hold on. Oh, I said 24. I meant, yeah, 24 and 25. I want 25, but I, I know I started at 24 on my notes. Okay. This is, the, this is what they're using to try to prove that we were rejected and they were put in our place. Replacement. Here we go. Watch. For if thou were cut, if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? We'll get to that in a moment. 
For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. All right, is what they're saying. He's saying they're trying to say that Paul said that the blindness of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So what he's what they're saying is that Yah rejected the Jews, the, the biblical Yehudian, until the Gentiles. So the Gentiles come and take over. But if you, you just read it, that's not what Paul said anyway. He said until they come in. So let's 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 break that down. On this holy Shabbat. Let's see whether or not they have replaced us. And let's see whether or not once again they lying on Paul. How are you gonna prove that? It does say the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay. Let's let's let, let us listen to this chapter. And let's listen to it and see it with our own eyes. Go to chapter 11, verse one, and put it in the chat. Go to chapter 11, verse one, and let's expose this heathen. Let's expose this damnable doctrine from the pit of hell. And let's expose them lying on our cousin. The very first line of this chapter, Paul lays down a truth that he wants you to understand so much. I say then, what? Has ya cast away his people. Question, yes or no? He said, yeah, forbid. What are you talking about? You, who came up with that? That Yah has cast away his people? He said, no, what are you talking about? How do you even come up with that? Still in verse one. He said, for I, I'm gonna watch this chat for a second. I just wanna see if you rolling with the moral rate. If you see chapter 11, verse one with clear eyes, would y'all put a 200,000 in this chat, please, on this holy Shabbat? He said, yeah, forbid. Which means no, never. So where did this heathen come up with replacement? And how is he trying to hook up something about the end of time and the end of the Gentiles with at the same time hook that up with with, with Paul trying to explain how the Gentiles get grafted in? It's too totally different arguments. Messiah is talking about the end of the rule of the Gentiles on earth. Paul is talking about how Gentiles are grafted into the house of Israel. It is two completely different subjects. Gentiles being able to be have been able to be grafted into the house of Israel. The Gentiles have been able to get in the house of Israel since we came up out of African Egypt. It's not a new concept. And Paul is writing, listen, pre, before, 70 AD, before the fall of Israel, before the fall of Jerusalem 
to the Romans. Paul is not even talking about the fall of Israel at all in this passage. Paul is really, if you want to go back to the truth, Paul is really talking about um, the sins of Israel and they're going about to establish their own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of Yah that has gotten them in the trouble that they were presently in. He also is arguing um, the idea that there were some Israelites that because of unbelief, they were taken out. And there are some Gentiles because of belief were grafted in. He never is talking about replacing Israel. Because if a Gentile wants to get in, they got to join Israel. Not the other way around. Do you understand that, you heathen? The Israelites don't join the Gentiles. The Israelites are not grafted into a Gentile tree. The Gentiles got to be grafted into Israel. But these lion snake talking heathens going to hell. I'm telling you, you better come up out of that Christian church and this Christian doctrine. Lying on Paul. When Paul said he starts off the same chapter that they quote, the same chapter that they quote when they get to verse 25, they don't even read the, the chapter, uh, verse one of that verse. Maury, how'd you see it? I'm a seer. I know that this sounds weird to some of you all because a lot of y'all don't do this. But all I do, most of the time, all I'm doing is reading the Bible. I just read it and I read it again and I read it again and I read it again and I read it again. And then certain times I pull out certain books and I'll read those books and I'll read them again and I'll read them again and I'll read them again until I'm able to compare scripture with scripture, until I'm able to rightly divide the word, until I'm able to actually see the nuances. And then when you see the nuance, which means when you see the little things versus just the overall picture. When you start to see the little things, you can see the lies. So they show you verse 25, but they don't show you verse 1 of chapter 11. So they got you thinking that the Jews been done away with. The white Christian church has replaced us. And some kind of way, they're going to pray for the Yehudian that we join the white Christian church and be saved at the end. You're going to hell for that. You know what? I made a note to myself. I'm going to obey the note. Remember I said I was going to hold your hand? So let's hold hands. Let's hold hands. Let's read this to the house of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Let's hold hands. I say then, has Yah cast away his people? Yah forbid. For I am an Israelite. You what? <laughs> yeah, I ain't no European. I ain't no Roman. Not, not by birth. I'm an Israelite. I was born in I was born in Tarsus, which is in the Roman province. I'm a citizen, but I'm not an Israelite. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a Roman. I'm an Israelite. Are you really? Oh yeah. See the Abraham. Oh, you from the seat of Abraham? Oh yeah. What tribe are you from? I'm from Benjamin. Oh, you're from the baby boy tribe. You're from the warrior tribe. You're from the tribe that hooked up with Yehuda. I know you, my cousin. Has Yah has not cast away his people? Never. 
Listen to me, Zion Worldwide. You've never been cast away. Which he foreknew. What? Why'd you not know the scriptures? Saith of Elias. That's Elijah. How he made intercession to Yah against Israel saying, Yah, they have killed the prophets. He's talking about when they was in unbelief. This is when they were following Baal. He, he's quoting a time when Israel was actually going into idolatry. And even this prophet thought it was over for Israel. <laughs> he said, Yah, they killed your prophets. Who? Israel. They dig down your altars and I am left alone and they seek my life. He said, man, they're trying to kill me. Who? Ahab and Jezebel. King and queen at this time. But, but what saith the answer of Yah unto him? This is what Yah said. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And Zion, you can find that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, as clear as day. Even so, I mean, okay, just like that. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant. There's a what? Even now, there is a remnant. It's a what? According to the election of grace. That means Yah has chosen a remnant to be in his house, even right now. And if by grace, then it is no more works. What does that mean? That means you were chosen to be in his house. Really what he's talking about is apart from the physical circumcision. I ain't have time to get into that right now. People talking about that means you, that means you don't got to keep the Torah. That is not what he's talking about. He's been arguing from the first, almost the first, second chapter of this book until now that people were making circumcision the thing that saves you. And he kept trying to tell you, no, circumcision does not save you. Yah saves you. So this is a reference to his argument concerning circumcision. And he already dealt with the fact there's another circumcision that's greater than the one in the flesh. He says it's the one of the heart. And you can find that again in Deuteronomy. How you know more? Because I done read the whole Bible. Several times. Otherwise, there's no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? What then? What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election have obtained it. Who is the election? The election is the remnant. All you got to do is go back and study Deuteronomy. You find out you the elect. Then read the book of Kepha. First Peter, second Peter, he says to the elect. Whenever you hear that word election, he's talking about the remnant of the house of Israel. And the rest were what? Blinded. According as it is written, Yah has given them the spirit of slumber. That's where we came up with that slumber bruise. He's still talking about Israel right now. They got a whole lot of Israelites still think they Gentiles, still think they're on their way to hell, still think that white Jesus is God, still think that the laws have been done away with. They slumber bruise. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened. In other words, you want to be like that? Then just be like that then. All this truth going out all over the world. You want to stay in that, in that Gentile European deception? That's going to be on you. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see 
and bow down their back always. In other words, and just be a servant to him. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? I'm talking about all Israel. Have they stumbled as a nation that they should fall, which means ultimately fall. That means done away with. Yah forbid. No. Never. But rather through their fall, that's disobedience. Paul is not talking about the fall of Jerusalem. He's talking about the fall of the house of Israel into the sins of the satanic and, and heathen demonic nations around them. But rather through their fall, salvation is common to the Gentiles. What does that mean? It means that the Gentiles get a chance. And I know this is going to be rough for some of y'all. You got to pray about it. The Gentiles saw our fall as a nation and was like, what was that all about? And because the fall was so great, they studied it. They studied the fall of our great nation. And based upon their study, they came to realize something. Their Elohim is Elohim. Because <laughs> look what he did to his own people who were disobedient to him. If you look at them, you will see that the scriptures are fulfilled to the letter. If you look at them, you will see the mark that they are the children of young. And therefore, they're like, woo. If that happened to his own people, <laughs> what is he going to do to us? So what happened? So then, yeah. We, we, this is pre-70 AD. This is pre-Babylon. Uh, I'm sorry. This is pre-destruction of the house of Israel. This is pre-70 AD. All right? He's not talking about the fall of Jerusalem. He's talking about the fall of the nation of Israel into sin. Watch. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles why? To provoke them, us, to jealousy. <laughs> really? Is that what Paul is saying? That Gentiles can get grafted in so that we can get jealous? Yeah, oh yeah. So you, so the, so the purpose of Yah allowing the Gentiles to come in and be a part of Israel is so that the ones that are in unbelief can see it and be like, okay, wait, hold on for a minute. You saving the oppressor? No. Oh yeah, if they repent and keep Torah and forsake their wicked ways. I mean, you blessing people that are not actually in the house of Israel? Yes. They're called the companions. You can read the story of the prodigal son. I know that's what it's called, but we're not going to get with that. that that's, that's not really a good subject. It's not a good title of that parable, by the way. But you will read in there where when he was in the hall pen, which is a picture of us being separated from our, from, uh, our father through sin, right? And the hall pen was represent the world the heathens, what made him come to himself? He got hungry. Then after he got hungry, he started looking at the way the pigs was eating. He said, whoo, they making me want to go down and eat some of that corn. And then he started thinking, he said, 
how many of my father's servants, how many of the hired hands in my father's house got more food than they could eat? Boy, they eating, boy, they eating up a storm, and I'm a true child. I'm his actual son. And I'm out here about to starve to death in this whole pen. So what happened? He got jealous of the servants. He started thinking about them eating good, and he's starving to death. He said, shoo, I'm finna get up. Where you going, Israelite? I'm going to my father's house. No, Israelite, where you going? To my father's house. I'm going home. Ah, I, I, he ain't going to like you there. I'll take that chance. I'm out here starving to death. He ain't going to receive you back. I'll take that chance. Why? I'm starving to death in this house pen, and my daddy got slaves that he's feeding better than I'm eating out here. I'm going home. All right, good luck. Ain't nothing luck about it. I'm going home and I'm going to throw myself on the mercy of my father. And as I begin to walk home, I'm going to rehearse my forgiveness speech the whole way. Father, I've sinned against you. Father, I've sinned against you. Father, Father, let's see how I'm going to say. <clears throat> father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against Yah. I've sinned against the house of Israel. No, no, let me say it like this. Father, I've sinned against Yah and I've sinned against you. Now, let me get my words straight. Okay, Father, Father. I've sinned against Yah, I've sinned against you, and I'm no, worth, no longer even worthy to be called your son. I don't even care. No robe, no ring, no shoes, no nothing. Just make me a slave in your house. Make me one like your higher servant. Father, let me say, okay, let me get that straight. Okay, okay, on the way home, I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against Yah, I've sinned against you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son right now. I know I squandered and I, and I squandered all of your uh, uh, my wealth in the hog pen that really is your wealth. So don't even let me be like a son. Let me, and, the, and, and that boy got up and went home thinking about the fact that the servants was eating and he was starving. This ain't no replacement theology. That boy started walking toward the house. And the Bible says the father saw him. Just like the father sees us. Coming from where? The far country. Having been scattered into the four corners of the earth. In captivity. In the whole pens. The whole pens of the ghetto. The whole pins of the country, the whole pins of this own dirty, nasty society that literally was feeding us not hog food, but the nasty, dirty hog itself. And we looked and said, no, this ain't it, this ain't it. So what do we do? We came to ourselves. That's called the awakening. And on the way home, we didn't come boasting, did we? No, when we woke up to truth, most of us was weeping like babies. Crying until our whole face was soaked and our clothes were soaked. And people didn't, what's wrong with you? We said, we've sinned. We've sinned against Yah. Everything about our lives was sin. We were worshiping on the wrong day, sin. Eating the wrong food, sin. Treating each other wrong, sin. Saying the law was done away with, sin. Not loving our brothers, sin. Not loving our families, not loving our wives, not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We realized our whole life was full of sin. So we started confessing on our way home. We didn't know how y'all was going to forgive us, how he was going to, or even if he would accept us back into the kingdom. We had broke the covenant. We were bankrupt. We were destroyed. So what did we do? We got up. And we started our apology speech before we even got to the house. But then our, our father saw us. And what happened? When our father saw us. 
according to the Holy Bible, he ran to meet the sun. According to the Holy Bible, he ran to meet the sun and hugged him and kissed him. And the boy started trying to confess his sins and asked to be made a servant. But the father was like, no. Y'all bring me a robe. Huh? You heard me. Y'all bring me a robe. My boy done sold his robe. He look a mess. Put that robe on him. Servants brought him a robe. He looked at him, he said, Servant! Servant come running. Yes, sir. Go in there and get some shoes. Put them shoes on my son's feet. Let them servants come back with them shoes. Put them shoes on his feet. He looked down at his hand, he said, what were your ring? What is that ring about? Your identity as my son. What happened to your ring? Pass men down in the ghetto. I could hear the boy say, Men down in the ghetto. He wanted some men down in the ghetto. Boy was so rough out there in the world. Pops, I had to hock that ring trying to eat something. No problem, son. Bring up, bring the family ring, the signet. Put it on his finger. Was his son done away with? Cast away with? Then he said, now kill the fatty calf. Not the old... Not that old musty bullock that's out there pulling them, pulling, no, 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 no. I want the young cat. Kill the fatty calf. And we're going to celebrate. Why? Because my son that was lost is now found. And my son that was dead is now alive. That That is to show that Yah has never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, never been uh, uh, throwing his own children away. Now what happened when he got back home? That oldest boy who grew up and never left the father's house got mad. And would not go into the party. They would not go in and make merry. Would not go in and celebrate. And the dad came out and was like, what's wrong with you? I knew you liked him more than me. <laughs> I've been here working all this time, serving you, never went against what you said. And then, but and you ain't never like even you ain't never called me no party for me. You ain't never had no huh? I'm like, no, 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 you ain't never killed a fatty cow for me. You ain't never called all my friends and had a dance. They're like, boy, there's something wrong with you. I always been your dad. I thought you knew me better than that. All you would have ever had to do. It's just ask me. But now you got an attitude towards your brother. But that's your business. Stay out here if you want to. I'm going in to celebrate. Why? My son is home. And it's right for me to celebrate. Now, Mara, you want a long time. Oh, yes. I had to show you something. This is pre 
70 AD. Israel had already fallen into gross sin. But Paul's argument is that he was never, even though fallen, he was never ultimately rejected. Never. Just like you, Zion. And just like me. Go back to Romans chapter 11, verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of this world, what does that mean? That means if Israel's fall is what allowed the rest of the world, one, I could even use it in the physical term, to become super wealthy in the physical, but he's primarily talking about here to have the opportunity to be a part of the house of Israel. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, what he says is, how much more riches is going to be when y'all restores them? For I speak to you Gentiles. Uh-oh. Okay. Talk to the Gentiles, Paul. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, and I magnify my office. He said, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I make my office known to the world. If by any means I will provoke emulation, I'll provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. He was like, don't get it twisted. I'm out here preaching to you because I'm trying to get my people saved. I'm trying to stir up them and might save some of them. <laughs> you, you heathens never thought of. You, some of you heathens watching the Moray sneak listening, and some of you slumber brews never thought in your wildest dreams that Yah would actually raise up a country, uh, <laughs> a country boy from the backside of a little town don't nobody know. And then he would pull this person out and say, now read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again so that you can show my people. I know you didn't see that coming, but it's here, ain't it? And we're exposing the lies, aren't we? Paul said, my whole office to the Gentiles is to reach my people. This ain't got nothing to do with no replacement. The only reason why I'm even preaching to you Gentiles is that I hope that my people will see it. And some of them will get saved. For if the casting away of them be the reckoning of this world, I mean the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. <laughs> Who? Us! Life from the dead. It's the Ezekiel story of the dry bones. We were dead. All our hopes were gone. We were scattered in the world. We didn't have no identity. We didn't know who we are. We didn't know who we are, Isaiah chapter 1. So what ends up happening? He said, man, but my preaching is what? To wake up Jacob. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump, oh, is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. This all means separate, set apart. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, he talks to the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in, not the other way around. We are not grafted into you. That's what y'all want us to do. You want us to graft to be grafted into Babylon and the Babylonian worship and mystery Babylon, which is this. That's what this is. That's what this is. That's what this is. We're not finna get into that. We're, we're out of that. Let's keep going. You want us to be grafted? No, that's not the way it works. It's the other way. And if some of the branches be broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in 
among them and with them partaketh of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. He's like, man, you get a chance to get in. And now you get the nutrients of the Torah, the nutrients of the law and the prophets and the covenant and all that. Don't you get in here bragging. Boast not against the branches, us. Don't lift yourself up in pride above us. But what is happening in the world? Everybody has lifted themselves up in pride against us. But if you boast, you bear not the root. In other words, man, you can boast, but you ain't the one that's got the strength and the stability and the foundation. It don't come from you. I keep telling these Europeans all over the world on white supremacy, you ain't the root. You don't have no say-so on the Bible. You can't even interpret it without trying to Push yourself in it as the, as the centerpiece. You even turn the image of Yah into Caesar Bourget. I mean, the image of Yahushua into Caesar Bourget. Going to hell for that. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root. Uh-uh, the root is bearing you. Wilt thou then say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Get that straight. This is not a breaking off based on 70 AD. This is a this argument is totally about belief versus unbelief. This is not about replacement theology. And they're using this chapter of all chapters to try to prove that point. And it's so crazy that they didn't start at verse one. Why? Because he's showing you right here. It's clear as day. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. That's why. That thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, you heathens. You slumber bruised. Don't you be high-minded, but fear. For if Yah spared not the natural branches, us, if he put us through what he put us through, take heed, you better watch, lest he spare, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of Yah on them which fail, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in goodness, and that word really has to do with righteousness in the word of Yah, to functional, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. What? That means if we wake up to the truth of who we are and whose we are and turn back to Torah. He said, even the ones that were that were cut off, they're going to be grabbed back in. It's right here. This is this is not really hard to see. It's, you just got to read it. They're going to be grafted in. For Yah is able to graft them in again. Yah is able to graft them in again. You didn't replace us, you heathens. The time of the Gentiles is when they're going to be in the place of the, of the, of the Yehudian. You will lie. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, uh, um, for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, verse 24, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature. That means you wouldn't. This was against your nature to become part of Israel. And to a good olive tree, how much more shall these, us, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own, to their own, to their own, to their own, to their own olive tree. Now let's look at the verse with new eyes. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness is in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles. That simply means until the Gentiles who believe 
what? Become in, grafted into the house of Israel. That's what he's talking about. And so all Israel shall be saved. That's the remnant. And the house of Israel will be at the end mixed multitude. There will be the true Israelites and there will be those who are the, who are the natural olive branches. And then there will be some of these wild olive branches that get grafted into the tree. And that whole tree that's based on the covenant, I'm gonna prove that, that whole tree that's based on the covenant that represent the remnant are the ones that'll be saved. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. Uh-oh, that's our king. Don't shout right here more. <laughs> there shall come out of Israel. It shall come out of Zion the deliverer. And shall turn away ungodliness from who? Your code. That's the house of Israel. Verse 27, underline it in your Bibles. Make sure that this is um, taken to the four corners of the earth. And Zion, don't you ever forget this. For, verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them. I keep telling you, never done away with his people. And he's never done away with his covenant. This is the covenant. This is the promise. This is how we live. This is what we already know. For this is my covenant. Unto them which I shall, when I shall take away their sins. This is how it happens. This is in the covenant. All you got to do is read it. And I just happen to be one that keep reading the covenant. Why? Wow, I love it. Woo! I love reading the covenant. I love seeing in the covenant what he has in store for those of us who love him. To those of us who are called according to his purpose. To those of us who are in the remnant. To those of us who wake up. I love reading it. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved. For the Father's sake. Who? Us. For the gifts and calling of Yah are without repentance. For as you in time past have not believed Yah, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For Yah has concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy on them all. All the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of Yah. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who have known the mind of Yah? Like who knew that that was the ultimate plan? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto them again? No. For of him. Talk, Paul. Whoa, my cousin can preach. For of him. And through him. And to him. All things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. If you saw that as clear as day, I read it slow 
put in a couple of uh, obvious commentary notes that you were able to look at that thing with new eyes? Would you put a 500,000 in this chat, please? We're not grafted into no European Christian church. We're not grafted into no Cesar Bourget. We ain't grafted into no Easter Sunday with eggs and bunnies. We ain't grafted into no uh, winter solstice. We ain't grafted into no Halloween. We ain't grafted into all this European garbage. We ain't grafted into nothing talking about the laws I've been done away with. We ain't living under the time when the so-called Gentiles have replaced us and now we got to come back in them in order to, man, please, that's a lie from the pit of hell. The times of the Gentile have nothing to do with replacing us as far as us being under their righteous rule and now having to join them. And with them 500,000 that rolled through here, eyes opened up all over the world. And all I can say to that is hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I told you when we started this, you would see it with brand new eyes. I'm looking at the time, but I can't leave you here. I cannot leave you on just the negative about what it does not mean. But if you understand what it does not mean, that we've been replaced in righteousness by some European Christian church, if you understand that that is not what that scripture means, Paul was talking about something totally different than what Amashiach was talking about. Would you put in this chat another 500,000? I got to get another drink of this double alkaline water so I can at least give you one point of what it does mean. I got to. Because I said in the subject, reveal. Time of the Gentiles reveal. So I showed you the negative. I got to show you the positive. What does this mean? And the way them 500,000 with 711 people in the room lets me know. Somebody want to know the answer. And as bad as you want to know the answer, I want to tell you. What if 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 the time of the Gentiles is not the Gentiles replacing us as Yah's people, and, and it's not the Gentiles uh becoming the tree and we gotta be grafted into the so-called white Christian church, if it does not mean that then the question is, what does it mean? So we're going to go to college again. We got we to gotta sit down. Y'all sit down. <laughs> Stop all that chewing gum and popping gum and carrying on. Stop all that texting and scrolling while the preacher is preaching. Pay attention. The time of the gent, the times of the Gentiles represent the biblical, the scriptural designation of time. It is a, it is an actual designation of time. It is. More accurately, seasons. So what the king is talking about as the time of the Gentiles is the seasons of the Gentile rule on earth. That's what he's talking about. 
not replacing the Israel as Yah's chosen people, not replacing us with the European or with the Hamite or with anybody else. That's not what he's talking about ever. This is a time period. These are seasons. And what he's going to prove to us in scripture is that the seasons of the Gentile reign on earth will eventually come to an end because every season of Gentile reign is evil. More I said it and I ain't gonna rip. I'm not gonna take it back. Every season of Gentile reign on earth is evil. And the word evil come from the idea it's dysfunctional. It's satanic, every single one of them. Not one of them is Torah. Not one of them is based on the law, statutes, and the commandments of Abaya, nor is any one of them bowing down knees to our Hamashiach, the Hamashiach of Scripture, Yahushua. And what he's saying is, those seasons, they're going to come to an end. And how do they end? With him reigning. What? What did you say, Moray? Ah, you heard me. With who reigning? The one who got skin like this. The one who got hair like this. He puts an end to the reign of those who got hair like this and skin like this. Go to, go to Daniel. Quickly, go to Daniel chapter 2. Go to Daniel chapter 2. I know I've been in here a while, but we'll at least read it, get it on record, so you Israelites all over the world can see it. You can study it on your own. We'll come back next Shabbat. We'll go deeper into this so that you all can see it with, with brand new eyes. Why? Waking up Jacob in these last days. But I got to at least get this. I have to get this on this video. We're not going to split this up because I showed you what it don't mean. Let me show you what it means. The times of the Gentiles. So our king is not referring to what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 11. Our king was referencing what the law and the prophets talked about, which is, of course, Deuteronomy chapter 28 about us going into captivity in all the world. The same way in all of the prophets, I don't have time to list them all, but almost every prophet to Israel spoke about this this terrible occurrence that would be the time of Jacob's trouble when we would be scattered into all the earth and treated like dirt to the all the way to the point where we would not even know who we are or whose we are, and we would think we were the actual bottom of the totem. We would think that we was a nothing and a nobody, even almost to the point of being dead. That's what our king is referencing. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. So when did, when did 
the times, plural, which means the seasons of the Gentiles start. When did it start? I told you when it's going to finish <laughs> and who's going to finish. But let's see when it started. The reign of the Gentiles on the earth started around 600 BC. Okay? 600 years before Hamashiach was even born in Bethlehem. We saw the Gentile reign on the earth. We saw the reign of the heathen. It began for us in Babylon under the Babylon under the Babylonian captivity that's when that's the first time that we saw this heathen ruling the world and began what's called the times of the gentiles let's prove it and because of time, oh my. And because of time, I want to get the verses out. Once again, this is college. We will pick it up right here next Shabbat, if I by y'all allow us. We'll pick it up right here next Shabbat. But I at least want to get the verses in this in this uh video. If y'all can hang in here for a few moments while we do that. Would you be kind? Put an eight hundred thousand. Just do that. Put an eight hundred thousand. Y'all know, I want to. I want to go deeper, but I'm, I'm kind of being prompted to just focus more on this next week. So let me get this in for today. Let's see what this is. We're going to look at the law and the prophets. So Daniel chapter two. And all you administrators, I know you putting these um, scriptures in the chat. Keep doing it. Let the world know that we're looking at this Bible with brand new eyes. Daniel chapter two, verse one. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. He did what? He dreamed dreams. Who dreamed dreams? Nebuchadnezzar. You're talking about evil, wicked Nebuchadnezzar? The one that actually sacked Jerusalem and enslaved our people. Yes. Y'all spoke to him. Yeah. How did y'all speak to him? Because y'all can do whatever he wants. And at this time, this king had absolute rule in the world. He was powerful. And Yah broke in on his sleep and messed him completely up. He was shook. He was shook, I tell you. Prove it, Moray. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Well, with his spirit was troubled. No, spirit was troubled. Ain't he the king of the world? Yeah, but you telling me that he can't sleep? No, no, his sleep gone. <laughs> king can't sleep. Every time he closed his eyes, trying to go to sleep, he had a dream. Wake up. <sighs> what was that? What was that? <laughs> you little puny man. You little. <laughs> No match. No match at all for our Elohim. Never. All the money, all the fame, all the power, high thrones, thrones, and can't sleep. Can't sleep break from him. Verse two. 
Then the king commanded to call the magicians. Call the who? You know, the magicians who claim to be able to do magic. Okay, get them in here. All right. And the astrologers. Who is that? Astrologers. We still got them around today. They can, you know, tell the future. Go get them. Okay. And the sorcerers. Who are those? You know, like the high priests and the soldiers, you know, you know who they are. Go get them too. And the Chaldeans to show the king his dream. So they came, stood before the king to all the, first of all, all of them full of, I told you my grandmama, she didn't cook. She said they full of stuff. All of these people are false and fake. Then none of them are real. I keep telling y'all, the wisdom and the knowledge of Egypt and Babylon is all a global facade. The, the wisdom of, of, uh, of Egypt was not Egyptian, it was Hebrew. The, the king of Egypt during the time of Joseph said, we ain't got nobody that can build no barns, man. I turned the whole thing over to you. <laughs> And now we all trying to be Egyptologists. Y'all better flush that in the toilet. Second thing is Babylon. He brought everybody in to Babylon. But all these people are fake. They're not real. This whole Babylonian thing is, is witches and warlocks and magicians and things. These ain't real prophets. Let's prove it. And the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream. And my Ruach was troubled, my spirit. Man, I was messed up. I need to know this dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Sarat. Uh, o king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream. And we'll show you the interpretation. Oh, that's easy. Show us the dream, man. Tell us what you dream. We'll interpret it for you. The king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. I can't remember it. If you will make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall, I mean, he says, if you will not, if you will not make known unto me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces. I'm killing y'all and cutting you in pieces. You understand that? And your houses will be made a dung hill. In other words, I'm going to tear down all your houses. And it's going to look like a pile of dung. That also could represent, I'm also killing everybody in your family. Why? Because this king already knew that these people was full of stuff as a Christmas. My, my, my grandma used to say, full of stuff. I'm going to leave it right there. But if you show the dream and interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. And they answered again and said, let the king tell us. Tell the servant his dream and we will show the interpretation. You show it to us, we'll interpret it. The king answered and said, okay. I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. Oh, okay. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to be slick. Because basically, I knew that none of y'all really can interpret dreams. I know all you guys are fake. And that's why, I, even as a Maury today, I'm trying to warn the house of Israel, stop being impressed by these so-called preachers and prophets. They keep coming over, well, I had a dream, I had a dream, I could see it. And they ain't got no, they don't know the Bible. They're all fake. I told you, if you're not keeping Torah, even your prayer is an abomination. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream. And I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. 
the Chaldees answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth. Are you sure about that? Are y'all sure about that? There is not a man up on the earth that can show the king's matter. You sure about that? Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. Like, man, come on. We ain't never had a person ask us that before. What? Can't nobody do that. And it is a rare thing that the king required. And there is none other that can show up before the king except the gods. Whose dwelling is not with flesh. All over the world, eyes are opening. I, I, I love it. I, I, I give y'all praise for exposing this and showing the world. For this cause, the king was angry and furious. Oh yes, of course. Because all these people are liars, that's why. So when he actually needed real help, now as far as just all that suit saying and putting on the show and pulling a rabbit out of the hat and blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, they could do all that. But when it came to the time where he really needed something, he knew that none of them was able to do it. I keep telling you that the wisdom of Babylon is not what you think. It's all smoke and mirrors and satanic. He was furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. He was going to kill them all. And they sought Daniel. What? And they sought Daniel. What? And they sought Daniel. Who? Daniel. And his fellows, why? To kill them? To kill Daniel? <laughs> no. That isn't going to kill Daniel, too. And Hananiah and Azariah, my, what? You're going to kill the brethren? Mashiel, Hananiah, Azariah. We got to die because your lying, because your lying Chaldees and Susan and Susan can't interpret nothing. So now we got to die. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said unto Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree so hastily from the king? Man, why is the king so mad right now? He been like, just take everybody out. Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time. He said, hey, man, slow your road. Boy, you got your panties in a bunch, don't you, King? Chill out for a second. I ain't like all these other preachers. I'm not like all these other astrologers. Soothsayers and magicians that make a living off of smoke and mirrors and sleight of hand. I need some time. And you give me some time and I'll show you the interpretation of your dream, Cain. Well, that was it, wasn't it? That's the way you talk to power. I, that, 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 that's the way. That's the way an Israelite talk. Who were we at that time? Slaves in Babylon. Captives in Babylon. Speaking to power like that. Kidding nothing about no Babylonian king. <laughs> Please. Give us some time. Well, then Daniel went in his house and made the thing known to Hananiah. Mashiel and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of Yah of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men about. He's like, man, let's pray and let's talk to Yah. I'm sure Yah will give it to us. 
so that we don't have to die with these liars and fools and musicians and tricksters. Then was the secret revealed to who? Daniel. So Daniel now knows what the king himself don't know, even though he's a captive in Babylon. Just like we were captives here and Yah spoke to us, and just like we are captives in this Babylon, and he's still talking to us today and showing us stuff that he has not shown the leaders, the presidents, the potentates, the people all over the world, they can't see it. We can see it, though, clear as day. When Yah showed him the secret in a night vision, then what did Daniel do? He blessed Yah, the Elohim of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of Yah forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the time and the seasons. He removes kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge unto them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O Yah, my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and hath made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said unto him, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Just bring me before the king. That's all you got to do. Just take me to the king. And I'll show unto the king the interpretation. Then Ariok brought Daniel before the king in haste and said unto him, I found the man. Wait a minute, I thought there was no man. I found the man. <laughs> okay, where is he? Well, he's from the captives. The captives? One of the slaves? Yeah. He's from the captives. Do you, do you know of where is he is he from? Because you know we done captured the whole world. What captives is he is he from? Oh, he's from the captives of Yehuda. Oh, Yehuda. I know about them. Ain't Yehuda the one that got Yahuwah as their Elohim? Ain't, ain't Yehuda the one that follow the Elohim of heaven and earth? whose name is Yah. You make known the interpretation and the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar? Oh, they changed his name. Just like they changed our name when we got here. The parallels are undeniable. Are you able to make known unto me the dream which I've seen and the interpretation? That's what the king said. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise man, I mean, are you sure? So the wise man cannot, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show the king. Don't you got people close to you, man, that can show it to you? <laughs> can you hear the slave talking to the king? Can you hear me like, hey, man, you calling me, but you ain't got nobody in your whole world, in your whole property that can show you this. Because they full of it. And that's what I'm trying to tell y'all. We'll get into this next week. That's what I'm trying to tell you all. Letting these so-called Europeans, these slumber brews, these Hamites, these whoever, you letting these people, J. Feth, I, everybody trying to pick up our book and read it and interpret it. They can't see nothing. How come they can't see it? But everybody want to talk. The crisis that's going on right now in our holy land involves three groups of people. And nary a one of them 
are keeping the laws, statutes, and the commandments of the Most High Yah, and nary a one of them is bowing down knees to our King Yehoshua Hamashiach. Nary a one of them have his blood applied to them that they might know that the covenant have been ratified with our people. So how are they going to see? We'll get to this next week. But there is an Elohim in heaven. Talk, talk, Daniel. What about him? He reveals secrets and maketh known to the, to, to the King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Uh-oh, we're getting ready to get the answer of the time of the Gentile. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are thee. This is what you saw. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What shall come to pass hereafter? What you saw was what's coming. And he revealeth secret, make it known. And he that revealeth secret, make it known to thee what shall come to pass. He's talking about the end of time. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. O king, thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. He was like, whoa, it was awesome. It was, it was amazing. This image's head was a fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron, and part of clay, thou saw it, oh my, you kept looking at this until what? Till that a stone, a what? A stone. A stone was cut out. You, 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 you kept looking at this until the stone was cut out. But what got you was the stone that was cut out was not cut out with man hands. Why a king uh, uh, of your idols and your false gods and your images are all the results of the workman and man's hands but what got you king was when you saw a stone hewn out of the mountain without hands, which smote the image. That, that's what got you. You saw this stone come down smote the image upon his feet that were iron and clay and break them to pieces. That's what you saw. <laughs> That's what you saw. That's what you saw. Then was the iron, 
the clay, the brass, silver, and the gold broken into pieces together and became like chaff. Became like what? Chaff, husk. In the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the, sp the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was what you saw. You saw how this thing ends. You saw all the kingdoms of the world. What you saw, king, was what Hamashiach is talking about now, the times of the Gentiles. We'll pick it up here next week. But what you saw was a statue. You saw an image. This image had a head of gold. It had a breast and arms of silver. Then you see a bronze. Waist, iron, legs, and then his feet. With iron mixed with clay. This is the times or the seasons of the Gentiles. Beginning with you, King, the Babylonian Empire had a goal. Why? Absolute dominant reign. But after you, media, Persia will reign. But they won't be like you. They won't be gold and they will be silver, but still powerful. They'll represent silver. Then after them, because what I'm showing you is kingdoms. I'm showing you seasons. Will the world and the Gentile world will move from Mede and Persia. I'm going to do this next week. We'll get deeper. They'll move to what? Greece. And the Greeks will rule the world. They will represent the bronze. The Greek empire around 330 years before Hamashiach. And then what? The Greek empire will fall to Rome. And the Roman empire will stay in power for almost a thousand years. Iron, wicked as hell. Then what? Iron. Again, what? Which represents Rome. That's the feet, but it'll be mixed with clay. What does that mean? It, it, I'll get to this next week. It means that there will be this Roman Empire that will rise up like the first Rome, but different. The book of Revelation will call it Mystery Babylon. And it will have a mixture that will not allow it to stay together and to be strong, which is exactly what we proved through the book of the Revelation. We already proved, but I'm going to go into this next week. This, this weakness of iron and clay, which is mystery Babylon, is the end of the Gentile reign 
That's the end of the times. And with them feet, I'm done. And with them feet of iron and clay. Yonder comes a stone. Not made with hands. Yonder come a stone. It ain't man made. It ain't Caesar Bush image. We're going to show you next week. That that stone, that ancient of day. Whoa! Yonder come a stone. He going to hit the foot of that. He going to hit the foot of that. Gentile domination. And that'll be the end of Gentile rule. You understand me? It it ends with our king coming back on that white horse. That's how the Bible ends. The end of the Gentiles is the stone hewn from the mountain without hands, crushing the last world power. Which is Mystery Babylon, which the whole world right now is under. So, Zion, why are you disturbed? Why are you troubled? That's your king coming. <laughs> this is the stone. The world is worried about the foul. Oh, it's falling. The time of the Gentile is coming to an end. But you don't got to worry. You with the king. You with the stone that crushes the empires of the world. That's what Hamashiach was saying in Luke 21. That's why he said, lift up your head. Be encouraged. Don't be troubled. Why? Your redemption is drawing near. If y'all understood that, put a one million. Put a one million in the chat. Let the world know. Say, wait a minute. I've been lied to. Oh, yes, you were lied to. But you read it for yourself. The end of the Gentile is what we see right now. On the part. But wait till I can. <laughs> Woo -wee. Wait until it ain't gonna be long, Zion. We'll get into this next week. I got. I wish I could finish, but I don't want to take y'all too long. Woo! Wait till next Shabbat. <laughs> oh, my. my oh my oh my oh my oh my. Wait till next Shabbat. On oh, next Shabbat. If I by y'all give us breath to preach it, let not your heart be troubled, Zion. We're going we're gonna to learn that this whole book was written about us, to us, for us, through us. And you speak listing heathens, and you slumber brews and everybody else, you better understand something about the real house of Israel scattered worldwide throughout the slave trade. And how, according to scripture, we're waking up to truth. And that even the heathens are making videos now. Yeah, Mr. the niggers. I mean the niggers. I mean that. I mean. <laughs> Boy, let me tell you something. They waking up left and right all over the world. Why? Because the truth is going out now. The times of the Gentiles. 
Christians is not replacement theology. It's not replacing them. It's the wicked rule of man's kingdom that will be destroyed by Yah's kingdom and how everybody that's not with Yah going to be destroyed like it, like like chaff in the wind blown away. And our king triumphant and victorious reign. Our people delivered a thousand years ruling the world during the millennium. Judging! And after the judgment one more war that ends all the war. Then what? The new Jerusalem. Where's it coming from? Coming down. Here. One more right who it belong to. Just look at the names on it. Every gate got a name. That's who it belonged to. Israel lights. Well, what's it built on? The foundation of the apostles. Who are they? Israelites. Well, who's in the kingdom? The remnant. And those that are grafted in to the remnant. Well, what's the temple? We don't need one. Our king is there. Well, what about the light? We don't even need a sir. Our king is there. What about doctors? Don't worry about that. We got trees to handle that. What about thirst? We got rivers for that. Woo! Poverty can't come. Streets made a go. Death can't come. Tree of life. That's the true reign. And that's the true answer to the time of the Gentile and how it's almost over. That's what we're seeing right now. Put a one million, put a one million, one million, one million, one million. Why? To say, I see it. Lift up your heads, Zion. Be encouraged. Our redemption is drawing near. Support the work of the ark even before you get out the video. Send a donation to the station. Keep us full time teaching and preaching this message. Israel need to hear it. The world needs to know. It's an encouragement to us. We're going to try to continue to be an encouragement to you. And until next time. To the 12 tribes scattered and companions. Shalom. The time of the Gentile. Explain.
Tschüss.